You may think that if you make a pact with pure evil to gain success and power, you're now untouchable. Your worries, like your soul, are long gone. But what happens when a group of girls who have made an unbelievable arrangement with an unspeakable evil encounter a foe so powerful they're helpless? What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listen in the dark. It's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my spookies. It's Wednesday, and you know what that means. It's time for a little spooky in your weekly. I'm your host and narrator, Enrique Kuto, and we have quite the chilling bit of fear just for you to enjoy. We're going to be heading into the cold, dark, wintry nights of a town just outside of Strickfield, where some very devious and evil things are afoot. It's a perfect precursor to our big Halloween season, where I remind you we'll have 31 releases in 31 days right here at Weekly Spooky, so make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcasting app. And if you're one of our spookies who hangs out all year long, believes a little bit of Halloween should be in every week of the year, well, we're so happy you join us all year round. And if you haven't had a chance yet, why not go to join.weeklyspooky.com and sign up for our Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get bonus episodes, two of them in fact, every single month, and a whole lot of back catalogs of whole audiobooks exclusive to Patreon, as well as a selection of creepypastas that are my personal favorites. There are already 105 spookies that have claimed their membership, so why not join them at join.weeklyspooky.com. And if you want to support us in a way that costs you absolutely nothing, I totally understand. All you have to do is head to your favorite podcasting app like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and leave us a five-star rating to let other spookies know that they are in for a scary good time. Speaking of a scary good time, it's about time for us to head to a little town outside of Strickfield, where Rob Fields has brought us another terror tale all about the dangers of overeating, in a way, after this. Be Careful What You Eat by Rob Fields Gibson Pryor was getting close to Garnet Mirren's house on the west end of the Pendleton Village limits. He was on cloud nine when he was given the extra-large pepperoni and extra-cheese pizza to deliver to her and her four friends who started for Pendleton High's girls' basketball team. Even though he admired all the girls, he mostly had his heart set on Garnett herself. Gibson's heart pounded with anticipation as he pulled into Garnett's long driveway. There were two other vehicles parked with her truck. He cut the motor and got out with the pizza warming bag in hand. He reached the front door and rang the bell. Seconds later, the door opened to reveal a majorly dressed down Garnett Mirren. Gibson saw she was wearing just a sexy robe but could easily see her ginger hair and tan skin. In kind, she was checking him out as she smiled and let him enter. Gibson couldn't believe when he saw the other four girls also wearing sexy robes. Before he could tell Garnet what was owed for the pizza, the team captain herself began rubbing up against him. Mmm, he just smells so dreamy, she told her friends. The other girls soon joined their captain. They too complimented Gibson on how wonderful he smelled. 
Gibson couldn't believe the Pendleton guardswomen starters were dripping all over him. He composed himself and again tried to tell them what was owed for the pizza. Garnet gave him an approving smile. Mmm, you got any other deliveries, baby? Yeah, stay with us, Capri Stanson added. We'll give you a tip you'll never forget, Lakota Diamond further added. Then he saw the pearly smiles of Skeeter Victors and Hanley Paulson and wondered if he was asleep and dreaming. The girls took his hands and guided him to the indoor swimming pool area. Soon all five girls turned and faced him. Gibson gasped and nearly dropped the pizza bag as the entire basketball team undid their robes and let them drop to the ground to reveal five incredibly hot, naked bodies. Skeeter took Gibson's pizza bag and set it on a deck chair. Then she helped Hanley undress him as the other three girls jumped into the pool. Gibson knew his co-workers at Chet's Pizza would never believe him. Soon, he was just as naked as the girls. Join us, Skeeter purred, gently raking his chest with her long fingernails. Gibson let Skeeter and Hanley take his hands, and together they jumped into the pool. When they came up, Garnet appeared in front of him and started caressing his ripped chest. Gibson felt his heart racing even faster when Skeeter came into him and began melding her lips with his. As they shared their tongues, he could feel the other girls touching and caressing him. If this truly was a dream, he did not want to wake up. However, Gibson's dream turned into a living nightmare when he felt the sudden, sharp pain on his shoulder blade. When he screamed into Skeeter's mouth, her teeth clamped down hard on his tongue. Gibson continued screaming in Skeeter's mouth as he felt more bites. Gibson finally managed to shove Skeeter away, but now his tongue was hanging out of her mouth. Blood was already staining the water from Gibson's injuries. He also saw the girls chewing on the pieces of flesh they had bitten off of him. Blood trailing down their chins and breasts. When Gibson tried to flee, Lakota suddenly sprang on him. Then her friends reached him again. Garnet and Hanley pressed their fingers against his stomach flesh until they easily penetrated it. Gibson gasped and barely got a final scream out when the two girls pulled his chest and stomach open. Blood really stained the water now. After Skeeter finished eating Gibson's tongue, she moved to the vacant left arm and began to dine on that. Between the five girls, they each claimed a section of Gibson's body. It had taken them nearly an hour to devour the hunky pizza guy until only the skeleton itself remained. The girls looked at each other now, their bellies full and satisfied. Calling Chet's pizza and requesting this Adonis was a great call, Skeeter, Lakota complimented. Hey, the meatier, the tastier, right? Skeeter returned. He was so yummy. Garnet smiled. You can still see, after all this time, our Hellweaver promised us years ago when we made our pact with her. We just have to keep eating the flesh of only other mortals, to get our heart's desires, and we started with becoming the girls' basketball team to beat in the Erie Shore Conference. No, the state, Caprice corrected her. Yes, we've been winning the state championship since sophomore year, Hanley gushed, and we're still undefeated. We already clinched a playoff spot. Then there's the full-ride scholarships to Shore City State, Lakota added where we'll continue our dominance, Garnet assured them. Then she chuckled. My bloodline in Strickfield banished me from the gated community when they learned I had a Hellweaver Bible. My family doesn't believe in her, only the family magics. The fools just don't understand that our Hellweaver supersedes all of that. But why bring us into this wonderful thing? Caprice asked. 
You could have easily kept this all to yourself. Garnet smiled. Because it would be very, very lonely. Also, you lovelies came into this pact with me of your own free wills. The others couldn't argue with Garnet on that. Then Lakota pointed to the deck chair with the black bag on it. What about that disgusting thing? Garnet smiled. Oh, that. She swam to the side and got out of the pool. She opened the bag and pulled out the pizza. Oh, boys. Just then, two large Rottweilers came trotting into the pool area. Garnet opened the pizza box and placed it down in front of them. The girls laughed as the dogs enjoyed their delicious treat. We'd better get this mess cleaned up, Caprice suggested. Garnet walked to a control panel and flipped a few switches to activate the powerful filtration system. After the girls removed the skeleton and disposed of it, they all went to take showers. The girls had done very well at basketball practice and were playing the first of their two games for the weekend. They had no problem dominating the Strickfield High Villagers on Friday night. When they were playing their Saturday night game against the Strickfield Academy Sacraments, however, that was when they met Danica McMichaels. The Pendleton Guardswomen had no problem besting McMichaels' teammates, but the captain herself was easily getting around the Guardswomen's entire starting lineup. The Guardswomen heard McMichaels was good, but they didn't know she was that good. However, the Guardswomen held off the Sacraments to the win by only one point. Danica McMichaels had clearly taken the guardswomen to the limit, but Garnet Mirren only smiled as she called her girls over and explained her plan. Danica had finished her shower and was ready to leave the locker room to join her teammates on the bus back to Strickfield. Soon she had that awful feeling she was being watched. Her feeling proved right when Lakota Diamond blocked her way. Normally, Danica wasn't afraid to get in another girl's face, but Lakota's predatory stare made her feel scared. When Danica turned to flee, she saw Caprice dancing. Like Lakota, she also had a predatory stare on her face. Now the rest of the Pendleton Guardswomen had surrounded her. Okay, look, you guys won, Danica stammered. What more do you want? You, Skeeter Vickers replied simply. You made us really work for our win, Hanley Paulson said. Playing that game sure made us work up an appetite. Garnet smiled a predatory smile now. Okay, girls, let's eat. Danica attempted to flee past Lakota and Hanley but she turned and fled into the showers. Caprice turned the water on as her teammates began undressing. Soon the naked guardswomen converged on Danica and began ripping her clothes off. She tried screaming and calling for help, but it was all in vain. The last scream Danica McMichaels would ever belt out would be when the Pendleton guardswomen bit into her. Danica's blood flowed all over the shower floor and down the drain. Then the guardswomen grabbed Danica's limbs and pulled with their supernaturally enhanced strength until she came apart in their hands. Each of the guardswomen now had their own section of Danica McMichaels all to themselves. They sat in the shower and enjoyed their shares fondly. As they ate, they felt the power again as they absorbed Danica's strength and attributes. Now that Danica had been assimilated among the many others these girls had consumed, they knew they would have no further problems winning the rest of their season. The following week, Skeeter was working out at the Pendleton Community Center. She couldn't help showing off as she bench-pressed much of the same weight as what the more muscular guys were lifting. She still couldn't believe this incredible gift that Garnet Mirren shared with the others, herself included. Wow, the more people we eat, the stronger we become. When the girls had first turned to their cannibalistic lifestyle, back in the seventh grade, 
Skeeter had actually been a diehard vegan. In fact, it had taken quite a bit of convincing from her friends to get her to finally embrace the pact between them and Hellweaver. Once she had taken her first bites of human flesh, she couldn't believe how amazingly delicious their own people truly were. Skeeter's hunger and cravings grew to where she consumed her own family, one at a time. In fact, for this same reason, the others came to live with Garnet as well. With the exception of their captain, the other girls had eaten their families and assimilated their strength. As Skeeter continued pumping iron effortlessly, she loved the attention the guys were giving her. Either they admired her sexy body, the fact she could lift that kind of weight, or maybe both. But soon, one of the regulars who came to the gym during the evening hours, a biker girl, didn't appreciate the attention Skeeter was getting. The girl threw her helmet at Skeeter to break her concentration and nearly make her drop the very heavy barbell on herself. It took Skeeter much willpower and determination to push the weight back up and onto the prongs. Skeeter quickly sprang up and moved to confront the biker. Just what the fuck is your problem? When the biker pushed Skeeter, she flew over her workout bench and landed hard on the floor. She couldn't believe the strength from this biker girl. When the biker removed her jacket and flexed her muscles, Skeeter became very hungry in imagining how delicious her flesh would taste. Skeeter continued her rigorous workout, keeping an eye on the biker chick. At first, she considered cornering her in the gym shower, but there were too many people around. No, she would have to enjoy the biker in a more private setting. Did you hear that? Better check the locks on your doors. Weekly Spooky will be right back. Skeeter followed the biker back to her trailer about four miles outside of Pendleton. Skeeter hid her car and made her way to the trailer. She figured the biker must have been going to bed, since she never turned her lights on. Skeeter reached the door and was ready to pick the lock. Much to her surprise, the door was already unlocked. She smiled eagerly as she slipped inside the trailer. Skeeter moved around the small living room and quickly confirmed the biker wasn't there. Seeing nobody in the kitchenette, she turned and walked to the back. Carefully, she peeked inside the bathroom. At first, she wondered why the biker wasn't taking a shower. Then she determined she must have taken one at the gym after her workout. Before Skeeter could ponder anything else, she was suddenly attacked from behind and found herself flying backwards into the one room she hadn't checked yet. So glad you dropped by, babe, the biker purred in a deadly tone. You'll make a great protein shake. Suddenly, Skeeter felt scared. Did this biker also have a copy of the Hellweaver Bible? Did she also have a pact to where she was eating other mortals and gaining strength and power from them the way Skeeter and her fellow guardswomen were? No, Skeeter yelled, determined not to be eaten herself. What is this? The biker cried in surprise as Skeeter lifted her up and ran her into a nearby wall. The two of them hit the wall together and toppled over a wooden table. Skeeter was quickly back on her feet and ready to attack the biker again, but the biker was already on her. Skeeter was shoulder-tackled and taken down to the floor. I will have you, the biker declared, moving to pin Skeeter down. Fuck you, Skeeter roared, reaching up and grabbing the biker's throat. The two girls continued to fight, wrecking many things in the biker's bedroom. After Skeeter felt several sharp scratches on her abdomen that felt like razor blades, she became scared and suddenly grabbed the biker by her throat again. Then Skeeter slammed her down hard onto her broken table. The biker shrieked loudly and wasn't getting up. Skeeter saw the biker was impaled on one of the wooden table legs. Seeing her chance, Skeeter moved to the prone biker and took hold of her arm. What the... The fuck do you think you're doing? The biker demanded when Skeeter bit a huge chunk of flesh from her arm. 
Skeeter's taste buds came to life like they had never came to life before. As Skeeter tasted the flesh, blood, and muscle she had taken from the biker, she knew she needed to have more. After swallowing her first bite, she bit off another chunk. However, the biker wasn't finished yet. She was still strong enough to fight back against Skeeter and pushed her away. Skeeter was too determined to let the best meal she had ever tasted get away. Remembering how strong she was from all of the mortals she had eaten, she used her strength to overpower the biker. This time, Skeeter sank her teeth deep into the biker's throat, so deep that she yanked hard back, taking a huge chunk of meat with her. Skeeter moaned seemingly in ecstasy. She had never tasted meat like this before now not even from any of her past victims. If she had to give a comparison, the meat she had eaten from other mortals tasted like seasoned beef. But this biker, her meat lasted as though it had been soaked in the most delicious marinade. The biker groaned in agony as Skeeter continued to eat from her. Skeeter just couldn't stop. Even her stomach didn't seem to protest this all-you-can-eat buffet for one. Skeeter kept eating and eating. Eventually, she reached the biker's heart and saw that the wooden table leg had gone completely through it. Skeeter kept eating and eating until there was nothing left of the biker girl but her skeletal bones. She moaned as she stood up, feeling how satisfied her stomach was at the best meal she had ever eaten. I can't believe I actually wanted to be vegan, she thought as she went into the bathroom and turned the light on. She got her bloody clothes off and stepped into the shower. After taking a long while to clean herself well, she helped herself to the biker's clothes before going back to Garnet's house. When Skeeter walked in, the other girls were in the living room watching TV. Garnet was sitting in a recliner and looked her way. Hungry? We just shared a DoorDash driver. Saved you your share. Skeeter shook her head a little. No, I'm fine. Maybe... Maybe later. Are you serious, Skeeter? Lakota asked with surprise. You're always hungry. Maybe later, Skeeter repeated as she held herself. You okay? Garnet asked. You look really pale. Just then, Skeeter was confronted by Garnet's two large Rottweilers. The dogs growled and then barked loudly at her. Hendrix, Marley, what the hell's wrong with you two? Garnet demanded, getting up and going to them. No matter how many times Garnet ordered the dogs to behave, they would not obey her and continued barking at Skeeter. Garnet gave her a look that said she needed to make herself scarce. Skeeter inched away from the dogs and ducked into the bathroom. After closing the door, she began to wonder why the dogs turned against her. She remembered how much they loved eating from her hands. She turned to the shower and reached out to put the hot water on full blast. Then she stopped herself when she heard the dogs barking louder and coming close to the door. Skeeter shivered as she moved to the window and opened it. To her surprise, she was no longer feeling so cold as the chilly, wintry winds washed over her. She quickly climbed out and got as far away from the house as she could. Then she felt her t-shirt ripping in the back. The next afternoon, when basketball practice was over, Caprice was out searching for Skeeter. The other girls couldn't believe she never returned home. She hadn't even gone to school. At least the dogs had stopped barking up a storm when Skeeter had left. Caprice kept calling out for Skeeter and getting no replies. Then she remembered Skeeter sometimes hid in the cave underneath the waterfall at Crystal River. Thanks to her enhanced speed and stamina, she made it to the river in just a matter of minutes. She moved along the side until she came to the falls then she dropped down and dashed through the water to enter the cave. Skeeter? You in here? Caprice called out. A moment later, Caprice saw someone approaching. Skeeter? 
She shivered a little at how cold the blowing winds were. Caprice gasped when she saw two glowing red eyes staring back at her. She gulped when the naked female form emerged. She had long ebony hair and chalk-white skin, with huge antlers and a furry tail. Caprice immediately recognized her. Skeeter? Oh, God, what, what happened to you? Caprice choked out. Skeeter raised her sharp claws and sprang at her. Caprice turned to run but couldn't get back through the waterfall in time. Wendigo. Skeeter hissed in a deadly whisper. Skeeter, no! Caprice screamed when this creature that was formerly Skeeter Vickers bit down hard into her shoulder. Caprice staggered a little and then fell. She remained motionless as Skeeter ate the large chunk of her flesh, muscle, and bone. When she finished, Skeeter leapt at the rest of her meal and proceeded to devour it. And just outside the waterfall, it began to snow hard. Hours later, Garnet, Lakota, and Hanley made it back to the house after having no luck in searching for Skeeter. Only now they quickly determined Caprice wasn't among them. After several unanswered texts from both Caprice and Skeeter, the girls became very worried. It was night, and it had already snowed a good five inches. Of course, wintry weather such as that was common in Feltner County. Garnet noticed that her two Rottweilers were whimpering in fear. She knelt down next to her babies. Seriously, what is up with you two? Yesterday I couldn't shut you guys up for shit, and now you're acting like I'm going to whip your asses. Suddenly, the back door flew open hard and fast. A huge gust of wintry winds and snow followed. As the girls moved to shut the door, they heard something off in the distance. Wendigo. The girls looked at each other. What, what, what the fuck was that? Lakota stammered. Let's get this door closed. Garnet stammered back, not sure she really wanted to know. The girls reached the door and managed to push it shut again. Garnet locked it up tight. That didn't keep the sounds of the wind out. Or what was calling out to them. Wendigo. Don't go away. Weekly Spooky will be right back. The girls were really scared now. They moved back into the living room. Then Hanley smelled something. Shit! Hendrix just peed all over the floor! The dogs were really cowering with fear. As Garnet moved to try and comfort them, the back door flew open again. Wendigo! Wendigo. The sound was almost to the house now. The girls ran to the door to try and secure it again. As they nearly pushed it back into place, she saw the frame was broken out where the deadbolt was installed and knew the door wouldn't close and lock properly again. Seriously, what the fuck is going on out there? Hanley muttered. We've never had a winter storm like this before. It's not the storm that's worrying me. Wendy go. Now the sound was right at the door. The girls screamed when they saw the blood-stained face looking in right at them. Suddenly, it ripped the door away, then it grabbed Hanley with amazing speed. No! No! Were the last words Hanley Paulson would ever say as the creature pulled her outside. Garnet and Lakota turned and ran. They stopped and looked outside to see Skeeter had bitten a huge chunk of flesh and muscle out of Hanley's neck and shoulders. As blood slowly ran down Skeeter's snowy white skin, she smiled with sinister delight right at them. Wendigo. Like before, it came out like a whisper that somehow seemed to cut through the noise of the harsh winds. Garnet went to grab the Hellweaver Bible. Knowing she couldn't secure the tome before Skeeter would reach her, she made a quick decision to grab the parchment paper, 
with the Hellweavers packed, as she and Lakota both fled and escaped out the front door. When they reached Garnet's truck, she insisted Lakota drive. It's your truck, Lakota protested. I can't drive it the way you can. I need to read through our pact, Garnet returned. There has to be a reason why Skeeter turned into that... thing. Don't worry, the four-wheel drive is locked in. Lakota reluctantly got into the driver's seat and started the truck. She shifted and floored the accelerator. What the fuck happened to Skeeter? Garnet turned on the compartment light and read through the pact that each of them had signed in their own blood. From the time Garnet had found her copy of the Hellweaver Bible, she could immediately read the language. Now she was reading over all the paragraphs regarding the girl's pact with Hellweaver. Finally, Garnet found a rather interesting clause. We're only supposed to eat other mortals, Garnet told Lakota. Eating anything that's not mortal... You think Skeeter ate someone who wasn't mortal? Lakota guessed. Remember how she didn't want her share of our DoorDash driver? She gulped. Well, Skeeter's sure hungry now. Wendigo. They heard Skeeter whisper in the woods. That has to be the explanation, Garnet stressed. We've eaten so many people and we all turned out fine. We were always careful. We've all played by our Hellweaver's rules. Skeeter must have been really hungry, Lakota guessed. Even though she's a skinny thing, she always had a bigger appetite compared to the rest of us. What could she have eaten? The girls had little time to speculate when they saw Skeeter standing in the road directly in front of them. Her red eyes glowed brightly. Her rows of sharp teeth gleamed in the headlights as she stared at them. Wendigo, Skeeter whispered again. Lakota floored the gas and drove right at Skeeter, who didn't seem to care in the least. Shit, Lakota shrieked when Skeeter ascended into the air to let the truck pass underneath her. She looked over her shoulder when she heard and felt Skeeter land in the back. Suddenly, Skeeter's clawed hand crashed through the back window and grabbed Lakota's neck. Garnet! Help! Lakota screamed. Garnet dropped the Hellweaver pact and grabbed Lakota to try and help her. Even with their enhanced strength from all the mortals they had eaten, Skeeter's new strength made theirs look simply just... mortal. The driver's side door was ripped open. Then Skeeter released Lakota long enough to grab her with her other hand and yank her out. Lakota! Garnet screamed. Lakota Diamond only screamed briefly, as if it was cut off when Skeeter began to devour her. Garnet moved to get behind the wheel, but she was too late. Even a four-wheel drive vehicle's worst enemy is ice. The truck began to turn until it spun around a few times before it went into a curve and forced the vehicle to overturn a few times. The truck came to a final stop on its top. Garnet secured the Hellweaver pact and escaped from the truck. She groaned when she felt the pain on various parts of her body. As far as she knew, none of her bones were broken, but she was sure she was bruised. Garnet knew it wouldn't be long before Skeeter would be finished with Lakota. But where could she hide? She was out in the open with no houses in the distance. She wasn't even near the Pendleton village limits. She focused and ran with everything she had. It was a struggle as the heavy winds and snow made their impact known, especially since she wasn't properly dressed for the weather, or even wearing a jacket. Garnet knew she didn't have any more time to study Hellweaver's pact to see if there was a way to stop or help Skeeter. Finally, she released it into the storm. Garnet remembered she was a Mirren. Even though she had been banished for her belief in Hellweaver, she was still a Mirren. She still knew the Mirren ways, and she wasn't going to die a coward's death. If she was dying this night, she was going down fighting. She knew she didn't stand a chance in hell against Skeeter, but she was going down like a true Mirren. She turned around and screamed into the winds. Okay, Skeeter, 
Come and get me. I'm right here, you bitch. Wendigo. Wendigo. Skeeter's cries still sent shivers down her back, and before Garnet could think about it, Skeeter was directly in front of her. Garnet screamed when she saw all the blood on her mouth, hands, and down the front of her naked body. All of it belonged to her former friends, her family through their bond with Hellweaver. Skeeter smiled and showed her sharp teeth. Wendigo. Garnet screamed and dove right at Skeeter. She took this creature into the snowy ground and threw everything she had into punching her face again and again. Die, goddamn you! Garnet screamed. You are our family, Skeeter! Even though Skeeter could easily hear Garnet, she couldn't have cared less. She suddenly raised her clawed hand and snatched Garnet by her neck. She quickly got back to her feet and threw Garnet several yards until she landed hard on the icy road. Garnet cried out as she felt her shoulder shatter on impact. She could heal up after a time, but she would become weaker and need to consume more of her fellow mortals to regain her full strength. She could also feel herself bleeding out through the breaks in her flesh. Garnet knew she would bleed to death if Skeeter didn't kill her first. It was then when Garnet felt her survival instincts come alive. She knew she didn't want to die. The only way she could survive would be to attack Skeeter and try and eat her flesh. She would have to break the pact with Hellweaver and become this thing, this Wendigo. Was that what Skeeter was known as now? When Skeeter walked towards her, her long tongue came out and licked at her mouth. When it went back in, Skeeter smiled, a predatory smile. Wendigo. Wendigo. Garnet screamed at the top of her lungs and rushed at Skeeter. She tackled her to the ground and quickly bit right into her flesh. Garnet's body came to life as she tasted the most incredible meat that she had ever had. From there, the two former friends would fight each other in a long battle to the death. Naturally, only one could survive this conflict. When the fight was over, Garnet Mirren was victorious. She continued to eat her former friend until nothing was left but Skeeter's horrific Wendigo skeleton. Garnet rose to her feet and felt her shoulder nearly restored. The winds and cold no longer bothered her. She could see how white her skin was becoming and knew she was mutating into the very creature Skeeter once was. Soon she would completely renounce whatever humanity she had remaining and suffer Hellweaver's unforgiving punishment for breaking the pact. Garrett Mirren would soon be no more. In her place would be another abomination that Skeeter Vickers once was. Her transformation finished when she felt how sharp her teeth had become, her long tongue emerging, and her antlers fully grown. Wendigo was Garnet's first word in her new form. From there, she ascended into the winter storm's winds and let them carry her to the village of Pendleton, to seek whatever victims were unfortunate enough to be outside in the hostile weather. And it would be on harsh, wintry nights like that one that this creature that would come to be known as the Wendigo would come to prowl in search of living beings, mortal or not, to satiate her never-ending hunger and bloodlust. At least... That was how the legend would come to be recorded at Strickfield University's website under the Local Legends tab. Well, my friends, I hope you enjoyed that newest terror tale from our good buddy Rob Fields. And don't worry, he'll be back with a vengeance with several exclusive novellas right here at Weekly Spooky come October. 
I love the idea of Hellweaver encountering an evil, perhaps as ancient as she is, in the Wendigo. But of course, I'm a sucker for all the Wendigo stories. I'm a sucker for winter in general. But of course, most of all, I'm a sucker for anything that brings about that spooky feeling of Halloween. And boy, is October coming up fast and furious. And I am working my butt off to make sure we have all of the content I've promised you and so much more this October. So please make sure you're subscribed. There will be 31 pieces of content to enjoy to celebrate the spooky season starting in just a few weeks. I also want to take a moment to mention I will be in Cleveland, Ohio, well, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, at Cinema Wasteland this October 4th, 5th, and 6th at the Strongsville Best Western, so come and say hi. I also want to say a very, very special thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters. These are folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show, and they are Johnny Nix, Jenny Green, Amber Hansford, Brent McCullough, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you guys so much for your support. And if you want to hear your name at the end of the show with all of the other spookies, just go to join.weeklyspooky.com and become a patron for $15 a month or higher. It really makes a difference and allows us to keep bringing you the show every single week. And honestly, beyond as we publish sometimes as much as four times a week, even in the off season. But now, my friends, it's time for me to get back to work. I also want to mention there is new merchandise at the weeklyspooky.com store. But for myself, for my producer, Dan Wilder, my executive producers, Rob Fields, Mark Shields, and Bobbletopia.com, and my composer, Ray Mattis, I will talk at you next time. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you are safe. Trust me. Ha, 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 ha.